Today, I'm spending a few minutes in conversation with Adriel to celebrate the launch of his new book. Adriel and I got to meet uh, initially because he was doing work with one of our portfolio companies uh, at the investment firm I work, Bar Taco, where he was helping to do what he's done for so many companies, which is helping to launch their sustainability strategy. And we met that way, but we hit it off because we're both so deeply passionate about sustainability, about impact, about bringing that to the core of what companies do. And as of today, he's written a book on the subject, and quite a book it is. Uh, I don't know if anyone else has had a chance to read the advanced parts of it, but it is both idealistic in what it aims for, realistic in what we can actually achieve. It means on real case studies, makes things very practical, speaks in plain language, even with humor sometimes, which is appreciated in a space that can be as stiff as this. And more than anything, he set out to write the book, um, I read somewhere, set out to write the book to inspire business leaders to kick off their sustainability journey. And I think the book accomplishes that and much more, and that is both a clear roadmap of what we need to do and an inspiring call to action for all of us, and I hope to be able to bring some of that for tonight. Audrea. <laughs> So I want to start with a simple question, um, which is obviously there is so much happening right now in the world for business leaders to be navigating. Um, oftentimes sustainability does not seem like it should be at the top of the list with everything they're dealing with. Why write this book now? Why focus on sustainability now? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I agree. It shouldn't be at the very top of the list. I think the most important thing is to run a really successful, meaningful business. And one way in which you do that is to think a lot about your sustainability strategy. And the way you come to that might vary. Some businesses come to it because um, their investors making them. And so what does it mean to run a successful business? It means make your investors happy and raise a lot more money. So let's figure out how to do sustainability really well. Some businesses come to them because they think if they figure this out, customers will come to them and be a lot happier and maybe pay more and, and be more engaged and keep coming back. That's a great reason for a business to use sustainability as a lever. So I think, now is a really important time in sustainability from the climate perspective, because there's all designs you can read, and now we're you know getting closer to agreement that this is a good time as any to, to make an impact. But I think what's particularly special about now is that businesses are finding all these different reasons and business cases and ROIs and all the fancy business school terms to like do real work on this. And before it was a charity function. Maybe it was an, like, an idealistic, oh, I'm, I'm Larry Page, how am I not gonna have a sustainability thing? Or like, Patagonia, some weird company out there, and maybe they're doing it, but that's strange. Now we're at a time where pretty much every business can actually figure out how to do this profitably and do this well and drive all the main goals that they're going for, and I think that makes this um, a lot more impactful because more businesses will wanna do it, and a lot more meaningful because it'll have impact across a bunch of different layers, climate being the most important to some, and business being the most important to others, but you can do both at once. Uh, there's a surprising chart in the book um, that showed the percent of private equity owned companies that are reporting scope one and two emissions, or reporting on the carbon emissions in their operations. And it was something like in 2018, 1% of private equity owned companies were doing this. And two years later, it was like 66%, something like that. What, what now private equity owned businesses that you don't usually associate with as you know bleeding heart, you know, trying to do this just for the environment. Why is it that even like profit-focused companies, you know, business-focused companies, are doing this now? For the private equity purpose, it's probably two reasons. One, the like the cynical version is that private equity has money invested in it from Europe, and the LPs are in Europe. All these idealistic Europeans who are hoping uh, for their money to make an impact, and so the private equity arm has to ask all the portfolio companies to report on their emissions, and that pressure has changed for regulatory reasons all that stuff. So you have that angle of like, follow the money and the money will make this impact happen or not, everyone's just doing it for the money. But I think at the same time, private equity people are not like, <laughs> nice charitable people. <laughs> You're just doing stuff because, ah, maybe this will make people feel good. You're doing stuff because you think it's gonna be a really good return and you'll be able to sell this business for more in five or seven or 10 years than you acquired it for. And so you're pulling all these different levers to do that. How can you cut costs? Well, can we bring sustainability to that and say, how can you reduce waste? That'll help us cut costs. How do you raise prices and get a wealthier consumer? Well, can you have a sustainability angle that people really believe and that'll help you get wealthier customers and raise prices? Can you 
um, like have a get become public at a higher valuation. Well, like the SEC is about to regulate this stuff and not even allow you to go public unless you have this stuff going on. So private companies are doing this because it's not for fun and it's not yet for regulation and it's not certainly not for charity. It's because they're realizing if you do this well, and if you do this poorly, you get fined. So don't do this poorly, right? Like, don't just like say you do this and oh great, we say it, maybe we'll get everything. Like you're gonna lose millions and millions of dollars if you do this poorly. But if you do this well, and you hire really good people who understand how to do this well, and they will pull levers across all these different business functions that also help impact climate change, that's gonna be really good for your investment. It's gonna make it go up. And if you as an investor can help those companies pull those levers, They'll want to take your money or your, your money will go more valuably. So like a lot of this book, I try to balance that like, oh, there's the money angle, follow the money, which feels a little cynical, but it matters a lot. And the, well, what can we really do with this? Like, what is the climate impact? How do you make that change? Because the people in this industry, they need to understand the money, but oftentimes they come from the change making capacity and you got to be able to speak both languages. Yeah, well, I'm excited to get into greenwashing uh, oh, in a minute. Thrilled, thrilled for greenwashing. But, uh, <laughs> maybe walk us through, when you talk about a sustainability strategy, what is a good sustainability strategy? What does that look like? Yeah, I have, a, I have these posters around the room and one of them that I really wanted to print but ended up not is saying uh, sustainability is like the Harry Potter Boggart. Like it's a million different things to everyone who looks at it, which is you know, a niche. <laughs> For your millennial readers, they appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, uh, which is why it's not on a poster. Um, but the point is like, it's really difficult to define. Like, can a steakhouse be sustainable? What does that mean? Um, can a chemical company be sustainable? Can an airline be sustainable? Is every software company innately sustainable? Cause like, you just have software and your employees ride their solar powered bicycles to work <laughs> eating you know, vegan yogurt for lunch. Like, I don't know. So what sustainability looks like needs to be written out. And a big part of that is first, just like measuring your emissions, knowing where you're at, so you can figure out what your impact on the planet is, called your carbon footprint, beginning to make a plan to reduce that. And so you talk about reducing emissions internally, so like how can you make your number go down? And externally, how can you help your customers make their emissions go down? Like how can you make an impact in the world around you? Talking about it a lot, so educating people, employees and customers, how to be better, how to do this better for themselves, doing all the regulatory stuff that you might be required to do. And I think very importantly is uh, working to make a genuine impact on the policies that affect this kind of stuff. And if you can do those things, measure, reduce, communicate, and work on policy, that is a excellent sustainability program. There's people's gonna shoot higher than that, and there's people who are gonna miss it by a little bit, but measure, reduce, communicate, and work on policy uh, gives you five stars. And, and even if we start with the most basic with, with measurement, you know, we now see for almost every company in the S&P 500, it seems like we'll publish their annual sustainability report, their corporate social responsibility report, and they'll have, you know, here's our emissions. Do you trust those numbers? Uh, it's a fair question. I think what people, what companies need to do well when they talk about these numbers is talk through the transparency of it. So just because somebody puts something in a report doesn't make it trustworthy, but if they tell you, has it changed over last year? Like knowing that someone's carbon footprint is 10,000 metric tons, uh, even to sustainability professionals is a pretty meaningless number. How does that compare to last year? How does that compare to your competitors? How does that compare to your goals? Like a meaningless number. So talking transparency, both on how you're doing year over year and talking about the actions you're taking to change that number and talking about how you calculated that number, where you got really good data, where you're still messing with assumptions and you're making stuff up. I think that's what's really important. There's a lot of backlash to it too of like, eh, it's all just made up numbers. You can plug in whatever you want and get it whatever you want out of it. I don't think that's totally warranted for 90% of cases because people are working really hard to do this well. But if you're gonna talk about it, which you should, you should talk about it through the lens of transparency. How'd you get those numbers? What are those numbers? How do you understand them? And action, like what are you doing moving forward to try to make a change? And Atlassian is an amazing company that actually in their ESG report, publicly says, we missed our goal. Like last year we said we'd be at, I don't know, a thousand metric tons of emissions for business travel. Ah, like we're at 1400, we're way over. And here's what we're doing to fix that. That's fantastic. Like you don't need to just always shine and be uh, uh, this glean of perfection. You need to talk about the reality that this stuff is hard. Here's the transparency and here's the action we're doing to try to resolve that. Yeah, one of my favorite examples is um, uh, Ghani, an apparel company in Europe, and it starts with, we don't believe there's such a thing as a sustainable fashion company, but here's what we're doing. Yeah. You know? 
Now, what, where have companies gone wrong? You know, even research for the book or through your work at Green Places, where have you seen sustainability strategies end up being net destructive to yeah. what companies try to achieve? Uh, it's a great question. I think one of the things that companies mess up a lot is this like search for perfection in data. Uh, measuring your carbon footprint, like I said, is the first step to doing this stuff well, but it's just like, you know, counting beans. You're, you're just like moving numbers around. You haven't actually changed anything in any context if you just measured your footprint. You have to do it, spend as little time as possible to get as much good data as possible, and continue year over year. So I know companies who will take like 10 months to try to get all this perfect data to get the best possible number, and they'll spend $100,000 on great software and consultants and tools and whatever. I'm like, man, that to me, that looks like $100,000 in 10 months that could have gone towards making changes that make that number go down. So I'd say like a search for perfection in data is uh, this asymptotic search that you're never gonna get to anyway, but it's also probably not benefiting you a lot. And I'd say that the, the second mistake that companies make a lot is there's a lot of like shyness in communication. Right? There's a lot of uncertainty, sometimes for good reason. Like, I don't wanna be labeled a greenwasher. I don't wanna be sued. I don't want my customers going after me upset that I said one thing and they did all this research and it turned out to be another thing. But I think that's counter to the whole point. Like if you come at sustainability now, there's this like end goal that we are announcing, we are now sustainable. Like we have, we have reached it, we are there, we are sustainable. That's not the goal, it's saying like it's this infinite staircase and we're on rung number six mm. and next year maybe we'll get to rung number nine and so on and so forth talk about it talk about your struggles talk about it either publicly in reports and blog posts and tweets and whatever talk about it privately in sustainability communities and uh, uh whatever your like ecosystem is if you're a supply chain company go to some supply chain conferences and talk about sustainability talking about it is really important hiding behind this like fear of saying the wrong thing i think is really uh, it's damaging to the effort to get this stuff out there and make it in front of everyone's face all the time. Well, on the reduction side, you know, I think a lot of people understand intuitively when companies are reducing emissions within their supply chain, within their operations, you know, the value there. Um, but there's been a lot of attention recently on offsetting, you know, and on the ways that companies are doing things outside of their operations to try and offset their emissions. And a lot of, um, I think, quite negative scrutiny on some of the projects and, and companies that are claiming offsets from things that maybe should not have counted in the first place. Do you find the offsetting space, do you think it's gonna disappear over time? Is it gonna be fully regulated over time? What, what's gonna come of offset? Uh, I'm generally bullish on offsets. I think they're meaningful because the direction from which offsets come is basically saying, no matter what we do, however hard we try, we're always gonna have emissions. You take this restaurant, it can be powered by solar panels on the rooftop, it could get all of it, let's say it cuts out meat entirely, and it gets all of its produce from the roof, and that's wonderful, and it, all their employees take the subway to work. Like still, they have glasses, they need to be manufactured somewhere, they break, they ship, they, they have pamphlets, marketing stuff, like there are emissions. So what do we do as a world saying, we're gonna have businesses that have impact on the climate no matter what magical stage we get to in the future. It has to be something that we can support in the world that's removing that amount of emissions or hopefully more. So that's what offsets are. Now, within offsets, they were all, offsets are only like 30 years old. They started as like an energy company in the 90s, thought they'd get approved for a plant in Rhode Island, and they could go plant a bunch of trees somewhere in South America. And they did, they planted all these trees, and Rhode Island was like, all right, cool, you planted South America trees, like, come on in. That worked so well, every company decided to go after offsets. So it's just like, headed towards a $50 billion industry that's unregulated almost entirely. Some things are happening in, in, in Europe. Um, but it's only, it's really young, it's 30 years old. And so I think where it's gonna go is cheap offsets are gonna be fully gone. And there's gonna be a lot of scrutiny around it, certain offset project types. If you're doing tree planting and calling it an offset, that you should stop immediately. Uh, if you're doing a lot of like forest preservation stuff, there's a lot of it that's really done super well. Um, there's a lot of it that's poorly managed and needs to be better regulated. There's also incredible technologies that are coming on the market direct air capture that sucks carbon out of the air and sticks it underground. Um, a lot of what's called blue carbon, which uh, takes this like giant biomass and sinks it under the Black Sea or in the Pacific Ocean, taking all this carbon with it. Some of those are far too expensive for companies to buy en masse right now because it's a new technology. But in terms of taking all this carbon out of the air and sequestering it and doing something with it, which is what we need to do to uh, offset uh, all this carbon that we as businesses are needing, 
is super, super important. I think where it's gonna go is what's gonna disappear is not carbon offsets. I think they're gonna grow in volume and validity and popularity, but the term carbon neutrality, hmm. I think that was an excellent effort. And I felt like over the last 10 years has been super important because it gave businesses something they wanted, which is a badge and badges get everyone all excited. And they're like, ah, oh, how, how do I win the next level? Ah, oh, become carbon neutral, cool. Like, how much money? Great, I'll do it, whatever it takes. But that doesn't account for the quality of the offset. I think that's the real problem. So my prediction is that over the next three to five years, you're gonna see 10% of the amount of companies calling themselves carbon neutral, but all those companies are gonna put the same amount or even more money towards high-end carbon offsets, and they'll need some new ways to talk about it. Mm, I, I've got, uh friends in the policy world, there's some folks here who've worked in policy, and oftentimes when I talk about what I do with sustainable investing, they say that we already have a solution for these problems, it's called government. Yeah. You know, uh, why focus so much effort on what companies are doing? Why not focus all this effort on policy and kind of systemic changes that might be faster? Yeah, um, yes and, <laughs> right? Like we should do both. I mean, there's, there's incredible organizations here who are working with thousands of people working on policy. They're working on it at the local level, trying to get um, Just Salad, uh, did this incredible thing in New York uh, where they, 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 they sponsored the Skip the Stuff bill. And now restaurants probably annoy you sometimes, but it's for a good reason. When you order on Uber Eats or whatever, they're not gonna give you napkins and silverware unless you ask for them. Now it's a local business making an incredible impact locally. You have things happening on the policy level across America with the IRA getting billions towards funding solar panels and different states competing for energy projects. That's all super, super important. The reason to focus on companies and the reason companies have an impact is not so much because, oh, I can measure my own footprint and make that go down. Meaningful, but your footprint's small in the context of the global problem, but it's because you can inspire movement so much faster. You can move money so much faster. You can make, you can give people jobs towards this work so much faster. You can write really meaningful letters to policymakers and the government so much faster. So the private sector has a really important role to play on a global climate change level. They are going to make a big dent in our effort to curb uh, uh, human-made climate change. They are not the answer. The answer is policy, but they are gonna push money and people and time and resources and attention towards that answer and pressure towards that answer a lot faster than uh, trying to get an army of individuals to write letters to their senator, which you should also do. <laughs> yes, and Now, if, if part of the pressure then can come, if part of the criticism can come from, from one side that says, oh, corporations can't do enough, especially recently there's been a lot of criticism from the other side that says, corporations are already doing too much, that there's this backlash coming against ESG, especially in the public markets, um, kind of questioning its purpose and its place. Have you seen that you know, in the reporting for the book, in, in your work, the backlash, and, and how lasting do you think it will be? Yeah, there's like states that are telling you like your firefighter's pension fund can't invest in anything called DSG, right. or like trying to uh, uh, stop the SEC from coming up with their climate bill. Um, I, I think for most companies who are already doing this, it actually won't matter. I think that companies who are doing this, some of them are doing it for regulatory reasons, for sure, and they're just like, oh, if the SEC does it, I'll do it. If the SEC doesn't make me do it, I won't do it. But those companies who are just waiting for the SEC to do something, they were gonna be the ones making the biggest impact. The companies who are just like waiting for some ESG investor to pick them up or the SEC to do something, they're the ones who are just gonna like measure their footprint, put it in a report and go away. They're not the ones solving climate change. The ones who are doing it already, uh, they're the ones who are gonna move money and effort and time and resources to it no matter what. Whether you call it ESG, which is just some financial framework to try to package this up and resell it to pension funds, or you just call it a sustainability strategy that a company should have, I don't think that matters so much for like the global effort. Some will drop out, other people are gonna lean into it harder. I heard this uh, uh, kind of reading about this kind of stuff. Uh, the CEO of Coca-Cola, gave this really good quote where he was asked by some investor being like, ah, oh, there's all this investor backlash in Georgia, or the, the state is kind of saying ESG is uh, uh, not the right use of funds. Are you gonna stop your ESG strategy? And he basically said like, look, I'll call it whatever you want me to call it, but I'm gonna like put less sugar in my drinks. I'm gonna try to source more locally. I'm gonna try to sell healthier beverages that have less plastic, cause that's gonna be cheaper for me and like healthier for my communities. I'm gonna try to like put more water back in cause we are running out of water and like, it's really bad for my business if we run out of water in the world. I'm Coca-Cola, so I'm gonna try to regenerate water. 
you call it ESG, you don't have to. Like, I'm just gonna keep doing this stuff. Yeah. I think that's the answer to like ESG backlash. It's like, oh, what if people are not gonna report? I don't, I don't totally care if people report. Like, if people are just reporting to report, they're actually, if they don't have to report, the brilliant people here would be probably thrilled that they don't have to do another like CDP report or government <laughs> thing. I think it's fantastic they can spend all their time on like actual changes. Um, and the people who slipped through the cracks, they, they were gonna be the one pushing a lot of change anyway. Yeah, you, you obviously came to the book with a huge amount of experience and expertise in this subject. Was there anything you found over the last year of writing the book that changed your mind you know, on the way in? Or where you learned something that you've not come across in your work? Yeah, I mean the policy thing was uh, through learning. So I wrote the outline for this book and Paul, like the last chapter is called Power Wielding. And it literally starts off with like, nothing you read in this book is actually gonna help stop climate change. <laughs> so let's talk about what will. And it's all about how policy matters and how companies should get involved in policy and stuff like that. And that came halfway through the book from talking to people, predominantly this one guy, Auden Schendler, um, who writes incredibly about this and runs sustainability for Aspen Ski Company, who says, my footprint is whatever it is. It's pretty big, I, you know, hotels in Aspen, restaurants, all that stuff, like it's not small. And I can make it go to zero and that wouldn't make a big dent. My biggest impact is on pushing for policy change, is on supporting nonprofits fighting this stuff. It's on getting my senator to change because my business's voice really matters and my business's dollars really matter. And that was really surprising to me. And initially I was like, ah, eh, like, really? Like more companies talking about policy? Like that can't be that good of a thing. But I think from reading and talking to other people who, who, who do this and, and reading about the incredible work that a lot of companies have done, I, that changed my mind and that became, I think, the most important chapter in the book because it's the one that's actually going to make a big change for what we're all trying to do. Yeah, well, I've only got one more question, but before I do, I just want to remind everyone books are for sale um, on the back table. So grab a copy before you leave. The QR code, you can Venmo $15. Yeah, or give cash to my dad. Or give cash to your dad. Whatever. Just, just let operation. me know if you're going to do that. <laughs> um, I think my favorite moment in the book um, was uh, a LinkedIn exchange. Yeah. A LinkedIn exchange you had with your aunt. Yeah. It, we have criticism from all places, and this case is from inside the house, um, where you'd made some, you know, similar to the points we're making today about how this is, um, you know, how, how uh, important it is to focus on sustainability, and and her pushback was something to the effect of, what? So I can't use a refrigerator now. Yeah. You know, I can't fly anymore. I can't eat beef anymore. Yeah. And so I think the final question I would have is is one that you actually kind of very provocatively end the book with which is, can we have it all? Can we have a sustainable world and still shop at fast fashion and, and have cheeseburgers and fly around for vacation? Is it possible to have both? Or how much sacrifice is it gonna take? Yeah, um, well, my aunt could be a whole nother podcast, but uh, <laughs> she, she's lovely. Um, <laughs> <laughs> she is. <laughs>